Um, I am the state director for Ohio Youth for Climate Justice. Um, I am 22, finishing my senior year at Case Western Reserve University. Um, and yeah, I've been involved in climate strike kind of organizing for a couple of years now, uh, primarily through this group. And then I used to be involved with US Youth Climate Strike where I was briefly the national political director for them. Uh, so real quick, just a little bit about Ohio Youth for Climate Justice. Uh, we were formerly Ohio Climate Strike. We're kind of a statewide organization uh, we host all of the big climate strikes that happened uh, kind of in September of last year. Um, and since COVID happened, we're not really doing that as much. So we've been working on kind of online education, content, that kind of stuff. Uh, we've hosted a few webinars. Um, I think the last one we did was kind of about lead house poisoning in Cleveland and environmental racism type of stuff. So I uh, just want to kind of dive right into the sort of purpose of this presentation. Uh, so one of the things that I really like to talk about when I get a chance to talk about kind of environmental organizing is the difference between environmentalism and environmental justice. I think it's a pretty kind of important difference to make, even if it seems kind of semantic or nitpicky with wording. Um, a lot of people do think these things are interchangeable. But there are some important differences. Um, there are some specific things that are meant by environmentalism that you may not realize that are kind of an issue when you're trying to be holistic, trying to be intersectional with your work. Um, and so, yeah, this is just about kind of addressing that and looking, looking at why environmental justice is, at least to us, the preferred frame of looking at environmental issues. Um, so environmentalism, and feel free to like unmute yourself and offer some suggestions. Like when I just say that, what do you think of initially? Yeah, those are, those are good answers. So like a lot of the things that I think people initially think of when you talk about environmentalism is, is exactly that, like plants, nature, national parks, Maybe you're talking about plastic pollution in the ocean, kind of save the turtles sort of thing. Um, and so the thing just to keep in mind while we're thinking about what is this thing called environmentalism is what's missing when you're talking about environmentalism and it's people. Um, environmentalism has a really unique way of looking at environmental issues where you often hyper focus on nature and stuff and you stop thinking about people. Uh, in fact, like a lot of environmentalists think of people and the environment as kind of separate things. Uh, they, th they think that those are separate things like the city and nature are sort of different places. Um, and so that's kind of the key to understanding some of the issues with environmentalism and its difference with environmental justice. Um, so on the flip side, uh, when we use the word justice to describe environmentalism, when we talk about environmental justice, what does that make you think of? Yeah, that's, that's, that's exactly correct. Um, so like, I typically describe it as kind of social justice work. So thinking about like these contemporary issues that you see a lot of protests around like racism, poverty, uh, homophobia, etc, that like you would initially think are not at all environmentalism. Uh, another thing I could have added to this is kind of like, protest or direct action. Like that's pretty key, I think, when you think of environmental justice, um, and not necessarily so much when you think of environmentalism. Environmentalism is just kind of like, well, I like nature. And environmental justice is more like, I, I do direct action, I protest for this stuff. So the difference kind of between environmental justice and environmentalism is that um, environmental justice kind of starts to make a connection between issues of the environment and issues of social justice, issues that are directly affecting, you know, people, especially marginalized people. Um, and then I think a more kind of formal way of looking at that is that environmental justice kind of looks at the way social inequality is reflected in our environment. And it kind of considers the place that we live to be a part of, envir of our environment, whereas environmental justice might not do that. Um, so uh, real quick, just to give kind of the full contextualization 
contextualization to what I just said. So environmental justice, I just want to talk a little bit about the history of it because it's important for fully understanding what it is. Um, it has its roots 100% in protest movements that started in communities of color. Um, this, I think the date people pinned down for kind of the start of environmental justice is 1983, uh, Warren County in North Carolina. There was um, a landfill, I believe, that was being planned for the community um, that, that was obviously toxic. It was obviously going to affect the water table, which was really close to the surface. Um, but they were just trying to kind of dump it on this community because they thought that they, you know, wouldn't notice or wouldn't care. But they did notice and they did care. And so, you know, they got up and they started protesting. And that kind of was the beginning of environmental justice as we know it. And then just kind of the key moment, I think, in developing this idea of environmental justice, especially as it's different from environmentalism, is in 1987. Uh, the UCCCRJ, the United Church of Christ, had a uh, commission on racial justice, released this really long report um, that was looking at basically how you could determine where kind of toxic waste facilities would be located in the US. Um, and it basically found that race above all else, above kind of like uh, socioeconomic status, above geographic location, above anything else, that was the determinant of if you would have kind of like one of these sort of toxic waste facilities located in your community. Um, and so that same year, Benjamin Chavis, who was the um, commissioner for the Commission on Racial Justice, he, in talking about this report, coins the term environmental racism, uh, basically asserting, you know, this is intentional, the way that these facilities are being located in communities of color. Um, and it is a form of racism, right? It's, it's, it's racism that directly and negatively affects the environment of you know, marginalized folks more so than it does the kind of more affluent white people in the suburbs who don't have landfills or trash incinerators in their communities. Um, so that's just a little bit about the history of environmental justice to kind of start thinking about the difference with environmentalism. So going back to environmentalism, uh, there are some issues when you start to remember that environmentalism looks at environmental issues without necessarily looking at people. Um, and that's, there's basically a couple ways that that can be harmful. Um, one, it can just straight up ignore issues that are affecting people, even if they're environmental issues, because environmentalists kind of look past people, um, even if they're not necessarily thinking about it. Or it could ignore issues that kind of environmental progress will cause for people. Um, and so I just want to go right into a couple examples to sort of make a little bit more sense of that. So in ignoring issues affecting people, uh, I think this is what I think is a very powerful example um, of kind of the difference between environmentalism and environmental justice. So in the early 1980s in San Francisco, uh, once again, we're kind of in a low income community, primarily a community of color. Um, and they were planning a new um, trash incinerator. Um, and, you know, the government required that they disclose, you know, whatever about the effects it'll have on the community. So they dumped this, you know, million page report, assuming that no one would read it. Um, and that it, it would just kind of get by and it would get passed because that's just, they wanted to build it. Uh, Robin Cannon, however, was a resident in San Francisco at the time in, in kind of the community where this was being planned for. And she did read the report and she basically found out that the report straight up admitted like, yeah, like this is going to be horrible for the health of the people around here. Um, we're probably gonna release like cancer causing chemicals and we just don't care. Uh, so she started working with her community. She was organizing it. She was getting them ready to protest. Um, and in doing that, in kind of working to protest this trash incinerator and, and, you know, better the environment of her community, she reached out to a couple big organizations. She reached out to Sierra Club and Environmental Defense Fund. Um, and those at the time especially were like major, major environmental organizations. Um, and what do you guys think like their response was to her?
Well, I thought when I was reading about this that, you know, this is pretty clearly an environmental issue, right? Like this is dealing with the health of your community. It is dealing with kind of, you know, air pollution. And obviously they should help this, this woman stop this trash incinerator. However, the Sierra Club and the Environmental Defense Fund actually said no. Um, they said this is an issue of public health. This is not an issue of the environment. And so we can't really provide any resources to you. We can't provide you, you know, no money for lawyers or anything. Um, and so this is sort of where you start to see that difference between environmentalism and environmental justice, right? Like uh, the environmental justice person would look at this and say, yeah, this is an environmental issue. It's affecting people, um, you know, it's in a city, but that doesn't stop it from being environmental. Uh, whereas kind of the Sierra Club and the EDF were more on the, on the side of, you know, well, it's not affecting nature, it's not affecting trees, so how could it be an environmental? Um, and then sort of another example, uh, this time going more into the um, ways that environmental protections can negatively impact people and how environmentalism can sort of be bad. Uh, two examples here real quick. Uh, so the spotted owl controversy, um, I wrote a large paper on this, which is why it's on the, on the front of my mind. Um, but the spotted owl was an endangered forest or an endangered species and it kind of nested in forests that were threatened by logging these sort of old growth forests in the kind of 1990s. Um, and so up in the Northwest in the US, a lot of towns still depended on logging for their entire economy. Like everyone who lived in the town was employed as a logger. Um, which was sort of problematic if you needed to stop logging these forests because it meant all the jobs were going to go away. Uh, however, environmentalists were not very receptive to those um, concerns from loggers. They were extremely angry. Um, they, they sort of had this rhetoric or this, this way of speaking to loggers that was basically saying, you chose this job. And you know, you're a bad person for choosing this job. So I don't care if you go out of business, which wasn't true. Um, you, you gotta remember, you know, um, the logging companies, they chose to do logging. The logging CEOs, they were bad people. Um, but the dudes who were just logging uh, were primarily poor people who were just living in the Northwest in these kind of extremely rural towns where that was the only job. And so your options were to kind of do that, or it was to cut your family out of your life and move away to a larger city where there's something else. Um, and, and so it was just this issue of environmentalists not necessarily looking at the effects of what their environmental causes would do, or even if they acknowledged them, they didn't really make any concessions to the loggers. And this is very different from how we see uh, the Green New Deal today, which I think is more of kind of environmental justice framework, uh, where they say, yeah, stopping the fossil fuel industry is gonna, is gonna end a bunch of jobs. There's a lot of jobs that depend on that. But the key to the Green New Deal is that, you know, they supplement that by saying, but we want a jobs guarantee. We want this kind of just transition for these workers. Cause they didn't, a lot of them didn't choose this. Um, I mean, some of them did, but a, a lot of the workers, you know, they, they deserve to have that safety. They, they are people too. Um, and then this second sort of thing about how environmentalism can have uh, bad consequences, uh, just the massive displacement of native peoples that was necessary to create the national parks. You know, I think it was in like the 1910s or 20s that we started to kind of create the first national parks that was kind of head started by John Muir, who was the founder of the Sierra Club, I believe. Um, and once again, this is not limited to just the US. Environmentalism exists everywhere. It's especially prominent in South Africa as well. Um, but you know, in this pursuing conservation, kind of keeping the natural world as it was or whatever environmentalists believe they were doing in creating these sort of pristine places that were you know, free of people, um, a lot of people don't remember, we had to kick people off their lands to do that. Um, and it was brutal. It was extremely violent a lot of the time. And it prioritized this idea of nature 
or this kind of like ideal of the environment over like actual people which is an issue that's not good that's um you know horrible it, it, it's an extremely negative legacy of kind of environmentalism that people hesitate to address so uh let's kind of pivot a little bit and once again free reminder just um you know unmute yourself feel free to chime in if you have any comments or questions um i know it can be kind of dull to stare at a, a PowerPoint and listen to someone talk for however long this is. So, you know, feel free to, to whatever. Uh, so let's pivot though from kind of talking very vaguely about this sort of climate or um, environmentalism and environmental justice. And let's talk about kind of the climate movement specifically. Um, so what are some things that, you know, you think are pretty commonly talked about from people concerned about climate change before the Green New Deal? Because I do think that's a little bit of a turning point. And the Green New Deal does represent some elements of, of covenant kind of environmental justice. I was gonna say something I think that is like very popular when it comes to climate change and people talking about it. I hear a lot of people talking about like plastic and like a lot of garbage within the sea and like on the beaches and stuff like that. That's what I most likely hear about when people mention climate change and how it's affecting the world and um, things we should do about it. That's the main thing they jump quick to is we should like, you know, start with plastic and like garbage. Yeah, absolutely. That's like, definitely a thing that people talk a lot about uh, when they're talking about climate change. They're talking about plastic pollution. A lot of the times they're talking about plastic pollution in the ocean. They're not even necessarily talking about like the massive amounts of pollutions that affect communities, or they're not talking about, you know, large garbage dumps that exist in proximity to communities and kind of like can be extremely horrible for their health. Um, another few things that, you know, are pretty common to talk about from climate activists, um, you know, carbon taxes, uh, reduce, reuse, recycle, kind of in that same vein of talking about, um, you know, pollution or not necessarily like air pollution, but you know, like thing pollution, like just garbage. Um, and they talk about, you know, they used to talk about just broadly eliminate fossil fuels. Um, and that was kind of the, the period after that end of the sentence. Um, and then can you guys think of any ways in which those ideas sort of fall into the issues with environmentalism we just talked about? Um, so a carbon tax is kind of like, um, it's difficult to explain, but I'm going to try. It's basically taxing businesses for the amount of CO2 they let out, like um, the amount of just kind of like pollution they cause, um, which seems fine. It's very hard to manage. Um, and it's also, there is a chance that kind of the business passes on that cost to consumers, um, which will kind of affect people who are poor the most. Um, and then reduce, reuse, recycle is kind of like just focusing on, you know, uh, waste, just litter. Uh, really encouraging people to recycle and stuff, um, which is good. Um, and then eliminate fossil fuels is, you know, uh, people have been talking about this a while. They're still talking about it. Um, climate activists used to, basically their messaging was we need to transition to renewable energy um, at any cost. Uh, and kind of they ended the sentence there and they didn't really talk about the ways that that might affect uh, the people employed in that industry. It's not necessarily the business owners, uh, you know, they're going to be fine. Um, but, you know, the workers who, you know, that was just their job. It paid them decently, um, but they don't really have any skills. They don't have any ability to get any other job if kind of their, their fossil fuel job gets shut down. So um, just transitioning a little bit into the environmental justice sort of framework and how can we apply that to the climate movement um 
So really the question is, you know, how do we work on social justice when we're working on climate at the same time? A lot of people think, you know, those are different issues, um, but they're not necessarily. And so like the first way that people should kind of incorporate environmental justice rhetoric into their climate organizing is just focus on the intersection of the two. Um, and there's, there is a lot of overlap, uh, you know, uh, you just have to think about the one report about environmental racism to realize that, you know, uh, talking about environmentalism does not preclude you from talking about other issues. Um, kind of our environment, where we live, it reflects a lot about the world we live in. Um, and, you know, who faces, you know, the most harm from pollution, that is a political choice. And that reflects the politics of our country, right? And so the answer to that question is often marginalized people, right? We locate, you know, uh, bad things. We locate, you know, trash incinerators. We locate, you know, um, I don't know, coal fire power plants in these kind of, you know, usually poor, usually communities of color, um, because those are the communities that cannot legally challenge it. You know, a, a rich white suburb does not want a, a power plant that's gonna, you know, pour toxic air into their community to be in their community. Um, and the difference between them and, you know, a low income community is they're rich and they can probably pay for lawyers who are gonna fight that. Um, so yeah, just looking at intersectionality in kind of our organizing, uh, making sure that we're talking about not just the environmental issues we face, right? Like climate change, like ocean pollution, like uh, deforestation, but also looking at and addressing uh, the ways that different communities kind of experience that, right? Um, because different communities do experience that differently. Um, and, and some have it much worse than others. And so we need to be kind of mindful that in pursuing solutions to these issues, we're not kind of recreating those patterns of social inequality. Um, which is something that might happen, right? If you just say, we want to end fossil fuel jobs. Um, and that's gonna be really good for climate change, right? Like there, there's gonna be a lot less CO2 emissions if you just stop fossil fuel jobs. However, you do not aid in solving a lot of social justice issues, right? You're still gonna have a lot of CEOs who got really rich, um, you know, from running a fossil fuel company for a long time. And you're going to have a lot of workers um, that are not rich who just lost their jobs. And so you're kind of recreating that pattern of social inequality, which is, you know, not really the goal of being an activist. You know, if you want to make things better, uh, you have to think a little bit outside the box. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of how we can apply environmental justice, to the climate movement, the other bullets sort of get, sort of get at that you know, promoting solutions that are considerate of vulnerable groups. Remember, we wanna make sure that we're not recreating the kind of negative issues in the world today in our solutions. Um, and then just remember that the environment is a lot more than just nature, like that, that broad category of nature. The environment is where we live, right? It's where we go to work, it's where we go to school, it's where we like play and we breathe air. Um, you know, that is still a part of the environment and that needs to be protected too. And I think that sometimes gets lost in conversations about, you know, capital N nature. Uh, people say, you know, if we want to save the oceans, well, let's just make another landfill. Um, but they forget that, you know, that landfill is going in someone's backyard and that's still, that's still a part of nature, right? Um, and so that's really sweet for the ocean, but it's not really sweet for the person who's, you know, getting that there. So then just briefly wanted to talk about um, kind of like how is our organization, or how Youth for Climate Justice focusing on that. Um, mostly it's been just being intentional about how we change the way we talk about climate change, how do we talk about kind of solutions to that. Uh, so, you know, when we're talking at a climate strike, we make sure that our speeches are centering around this idea of justice um, and not just kind of like reduce emissions. We want to make sure that, you know, um, in reducing emissions, we're also ensuring that people get the justice they need. 
um, because, you know, it's not worth it to keep the earth going if you're not making it a better place for people to. Um, we are making sure to partner with groups that, you know, people might consider to be non-environmental, um, but, you know, everything's an environmental issue or a lot of things are environmental issues. So, uh, you know, like we signed on to, there was a big protest outside the presidential debate. That was a, that was a broad group of people who were focusing on a lot of different issues. Um, but we made sure to partner onto that because we understand that, you know, those issues affect the environment um, and those, those issues intersect with the environment. Um, and then lastly, yeah, for the last um, summer, maybe, I don't know, a, a good number of months now, uh, kind of the campaign we've been working on is environmental justice is racial justice. Um, there are a lot of environmental racism issues in Ohio that we've been trying to do educational work about. Uh, right now, we're really prevented from doing any protests or anything because of COVID, uh, but we've just been trying to kind of do educational work. Um, and then in the future, we might start trying to plan some sort of like protests around this. Um, but yeah, there are, there are a lot of issues in that vein that you can read up on. Um, off the top of my head, things I know we talked about uh, were Winton Terrace in Cincinnati is a kind of low income community of color that has uh, a lot, like a bunch of different sort of factories right around it. Um, and, you know, you can just look at statistics about like rates of asthma, rates of different sort of uh, breath diseases like that. I don't know if asthma is a disease, but conditions. Um, and, and you can kind of look at that and start and see sort of the way that environmental racism manifests in Ohio, right, in the, in the place we live. Um, and then the other thing I know we talked about, which is right in my city in Cleveland, is uh, Cleveland has a really, really high rate of lead poisoning. Uh, it's actually higher than in Flint, Michigan. Um, and that is because Cleveland has a very, very, you know, low income, mostly, uh, you know, you know, black neighborhood that is mostly rental properties. And so lead paint was banned in new buildings in I think the 1970s by the federal government, but that standard doesn't really apply to kind of rental properties that are old and not being renovated. And so it's kind of this vicious cycle where, you know, people who are buying these rental, or not buying, but renting these rental properties, so primarily poor people, are primarily the ones being affected by it, are primarily the ones, you know, being exposed to lead at this extremely high rate. Um, and there, there's a whole lot of other stuff I could talk about uh, about that issue. Uh, there are some really, really cool groups in Cleveland that have been, you know, doing work on that, that have been trying to petition the government, that have been writing legislation to try and get that to stop. Um, I believe the organization is called Clash, Cleveland Lead Advocates for Safe Housing, if you wanted to look them up. They're, they're a really great group. Um, yeah, uh, I, I don't know what I, was, what I was about to say about that. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the issues we have been trying to talk about uh, lately, um, which, you know, those are, those are not climate change. Those are actually very far away from climate change. But they are still environmental issues. They're still issues of social justice. And those are kind of the things that we as an organization wanted to talk about. Um, you know, especially the local ones, it is a lot easier to make substantial change on those as kind of just a person living in Ohio than it is to, as a person living in Ohio, make change on climate change. And so we wanna make sure that, you know, uh, when we're out there, when we're planning protests, whatever it is we're doing, we're, you know, trying to get something done, right? We're not just doing it for the sake of it. Um, so just a couple more slides, I think. Uh, just a quick obligatory, how can you get involved if you're interested at all? Um, this is just the information for our organization. Um, there are plenty of other organizations in Ohio as well that uh, I know some of uh, that you could get involved with. Um, 
and then kind of just a little cavity at the bottom. It's not hard. It's not like a huge commitment to get involved. It's kind of what you make of it. It's sort of like an extracurricular. Um, and the movement has room for everyone, right? You don't need to be someone going to protest to be someone who plans protests, right? We need people who run social media. We need people who make graphics. We need people who just, you know, show up to meetings and help generate ideas. Um, so, you know, just just an option.